Shabbat Shalom. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, I'm going to Israel tomorrow. Uh, the flight leaves at 2 p.m. from LAX. I'll be back on Thursday morning. So back before next Shabbat, it's going to be a very quick trip. And as I'm sure all of you are thinking, I'm sure all of you can imagine, um, there are many, many, many thoughts, many, many feelings that, that I'm having and that all the rabbis that are going on this trip are having. For me, um, I was last in Israel in May 2017, which was a little while ago before the pandemic. I, I actually left on Yom Yerushalayim, so it was a very eventful day when, when I left, a day of celebration and, and sometimes a day of tension, but a day of celebration. And um, I was on a Zoom earlier this week on Tuesday to, for the rabbis on this trip to kind of orient us and, and prepare us for what we're going to do. And the, it's at the beginning of the Zoom, one of the, the trip leaders was describing how we'll arrive on, on Monday. So the flight leaves LAX at 2 p.m. and arrives in Tel Aviv uh, Monday, 2 p.m. So Sunday to Monday, 2 p.m., 2 p.m., which is a little you know, disoriented in time. Um, but so we'll go directly from the, um, the airport in Tel Aviv to our hotel in Jerusalem. And then shortly after that, we'll take a walk from our hotel to the Fuchsburg Center. And, and people were saying, people, rabbis who have been to Israel already since um, October 7th, say that even walking around Jerusalem, things don't feel the same. And of course, I have very strong and heartfelt memories of, of walking that path in Jerusalem. And... Um, I don't think I'm ready for how different it's going to feel, but, but it's going to be an experience, that's for sure. Um, since I left Israel the last time, I've been yearning to go back. Um, I know that many of us were here for uh, the second day of Rosh Hashanah. I told the story of my relationship with Israel um, when I spoke uh, in the Devar Torah, and I haven't had the opportunity yet since those times and since those memories to return to Israel and, and build new memories. Um, when this war started, I'll be honest, there was a, a part of me for more than just a small moment. It was really an extended moment and where I was thinking, am I ever going to be able to go back? Uh, is, are things going to be okay enough in our holy land that I'll be able to return in my lifetime? Um, I don't know if others of you had that thought, but it definitely stayed with me for um, more, more than a moment, more than a short moment. And so when this opportunity came up to go on this rabbi's mission, a solidarity mission to Israel, um, I jumped at the opportunity right away, even before I knew really what this trip was about. But as I learned more about what we'll, what we'll be doing in the three short days we'll be in, in, in Israel, it felt beshert. The trip felt exactly right for, for me and what I can do as a rabbi for the Jewish people um, here in our community and, and in Israel. So the, the first purpose of the trip is I've been, and these things that I'm explaining, I've mentioned a couple of times, so you, um, you've probably heard them from me before, but so the first purpose of the trip is to make this journey physically um, and send a crucial message of support to our Masorti colleagues, uh, conservative rabbis in Israel, along with all of Israel, that we stand with them and that they're not alone. So the, there's a, a tremendous value that I think all of us know, especially in these days post-pandemic, that the value of showing up however you can is an incredible value. This is why we still continue to have people attending our service virtually, because even though the pandemic is, is waning and changing, not everyone is able to attend in person. But those of us who are, are able to attend in person know that value of coming out of isolation and showing up and being there present for, for one another. Uh, you know, I was thinking about the, the irreplaceable value of in-person interactions, and one of the things that I thought about was um, when I had COVID one of the times during the pandemic, I had to do Instacart grocery shopping, and you don't get to pick your own groceries, and they, I ordered the blueberry yogurt, and I got the mixed berry yogurt, and I was like, this is not this, you know, because even if you don't show up in person, it's not quite the same. And, and I think that this, this recognition of how important it is to, to give something physical in, in one's presence is why these drives for supplies, collecting hats and socks and backpacks, have not just been so important for the Israeli army, but so important for us to know that this backpack that we are touching, this backpack that we personally purchased, not just the money, but the physical object, is going from, from our hands to the hands of a soldier. Um, and, and thinking also about uh, 
family and fam visiting family during the pandemic and how, you know, it, at least for me, it wasn't the same just talking over Zoom or FaceTime. Being able to, to be there in person when, when I could was, was so much better. So this value of making this journey and showing up physically in person to communicate that we stand in solidarity, that our colleagues in Israel are not alone is so essential. Now, the, the purpose of the trip, um, our focus is going to be the work of our rabbinic colleagues across Israel to support thousands of displaced Israelis, to visit the injured and to comfort the mourners. Um, a couple of, of people in, uh, that I've spoken to as I'm preparing for this trip were, were reminding me that I should bring gardening gloves, that it's important to bring gardening gloves so that I, because I'm obviously going to be picking vegetables. And it's, uh, it's interesting that in the orientations to this trip, one of the things that we were told is that we are specifically not picking vegetables. We are going there to, to volunteer and to, do, and to do work, but to do the type of work that can only be done with rabbinic training and experience. Um, the, I, I think that when many people think of rabbinic work, you think of moments like this, where I'm standing on the beam and I'm speaking to people about things, but there's also a piece of rabbinic work that is, I'm gonna go ahead and say a little bit less glamorous, and then we call it pastoral counseling. Um, you think about, uh, I know many people have probably seen the television show MASH, MASH, and even gone on a hike to this, this site where MASH was filmed, and so there is, there is a chaplain in that show, a military chaplain, not a rabbi, but rabbis also serve as military chaplains, providing um, care that is, it's not therapy, but it's a therapeutic presence, a pastoral presence to people who are in special situations where they're under a unique type of stress. Um, part of the rabbinic experience that I've had the privilege to have before coming to Adat Shalom as senior rabbi is working as a chaplain um, at, at Beit Yeshuvah, which is a Jewish rehab, and I was working, um, providing that chaplaincy as a rabbi to those who are in early recovery from addiction, which, if any of you have experienced this with your family or your friends, it's a difficult experience to be in early recovery from addiction, and I was there during the pandemic and as the pandemic began. Now this was a time of, of crisis upon crisis, and so this experience that I've had as a rabbi is unique. Not every rabbi gets to have that experience, and I'll be able to bring this experience to those affected by this current crisis, this horrible war in the land of Israel. And so I, I feel uniquely humbled and uniquely grateful to share my experiences with those who are in need. There, so I mentioned um, a few moments ago, earlier this week, there was a, a Zoom for us to prepare and it was a little bit more logistical. I'll be speaking about that in a moment, but I want to share with you an experience that I had, not yesterday, but a week ago yesterday, last week on Friday, and it was like, okay, all right, these 20 rabbis, get ready, we're gonna talk about the trip, it's gonna be great, show up to the Zoom. And so I was like, okay, you know, I had my notebook in hand, I was, what hotel are we staying at? Uh, you know, what are the times of this and that? They didn't have that information for us yet last Friday uh, or a week ago Friday. Um, and I was very surprised actually that um, they brought on a rabbinic chaplain to speak to us about trauma-informed care. And, and I, didn't, I didn't really know that they were going to give us uh, this lesson on you know, um, this specialty within mental health, which is not something I know that much about. Um, I'm, I don't have training as a mental health professional. And so trauma-informed care that's a buzzword that I'm sure many of us have heard, and I've definitely heard. Uh, and in the 20 minutes of education, I can't say I'm a professional. But what, um, what I took from it, which was very interesting and, and very relatable, is that you know, in, in this crisis that we're experiencing right now, and in uh, similar crises that have to do with world events, there are those of us who have to watch the news, and there are those of us who have to avoid the news. Right, there are those of us that have to watch news, we have to stay glued, or because we have to know. And and those of us who are like, okay, I need to take a break. I've got to put it down. I can't listen to the radio. I've got to ignore the New York Times, even though it's being delivered to my home. You know, and I feel like there's there's these two categories that many of us fit into one or the other. And so they were explaining to us that for the people that need to follow the news, let them follow the news. If you think it's stressing you out. Don't worry about it. It's, if the person is following the news and that's bringing them comfort and a feeling of safety, encourage that. At the same time, the people who need to avoid the news, don't tell them they should be more informed. Let them avoid the news because that's bringing them safety and a feeling of comfort. And I never thought really about it like that before, that, that each person is unique 
And I, as a rabbi, can help each person do what they need to do uniquely in order to feel safe. Um, and so that, that's what I know so far about trauma-informed care. I might learn some things in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for more. Um, and you know, I think some of us are into the touchy-feely stuff. I'm obviously one of those people, but let's go on to the logistics, because I think that a lot of us are wondering, what exactly am I going to be doing? Now, this is, this is subject to change. So I'll be leaving LA on Sunday, arriving in Tel Aviv on Monday. We'll be going straight to um, the hotel, the Waldorf in Jerusalem. So the accommodations are gonna be quite nice. So thank you, Rabbinical Assembly. Um, then we'll be going to the World Zionist Organization building, uh, meeting with Dr. Yitzhar Hess, who I think that many of us who've met over Zoom, um, the vice chairman of the World Zionist Organization, and hearing speakers from the Masorti movement. Um, right after that, we're going to be meeting with, and this is, this is even emotional to share, the students who are on the Nativ right now, the conservative movement's um, gap year program, and the students at the conservative yeshiva who decide to spend this year in Israel pursuing Jewish study just because they want to. And so these um, English speaking, mostly but not all American young people who are you know, caught up in this situation, we're gonna be speaking with them, hearing their experiences and providing them with some care. Um, next was a special dinner for Masorti rabbis, and so that will be an opportunity for people uh, who are living in Israel, working as rabbis, people who have traveled to Israel to kind of gather. I expect to run into people I haven't seen in years, as well as meeting some new friends, and, and just talk and just be with one another um, and, and provide that, that comfort because I, I haven't been there, right? So I'm a little bit more rested from the situation and my colleagues who have been there comforting their communities throughout this, this crisis since the beginning, I'll be able to provide some care to them and we all will be able to provide some care to them. So that will be a real blessing. Now on Tuesday, this is again, subject to confirmation because anything can happen, right? But Tuesday, the plan is that we will go to Kafar Aza and we'll be able to see firsthand what happened there. We'll be visiting um, different communities where people have been moved to because they've been displaced, um, visiting the, the sick, comforting the mourners, and, and also hearing firsthand from Masorti rabbis who are from that area and who are dealing with the crisis as it happened on real time or in real time. And so that will be the day on Tuesday. Wednesday will be our last day. We will um, briefly visit the Kotel, which I always look forward to. Um, and then we'll be leaving Jerusalem, driving to Tel Aviv, um, meeting with families of, uh, who, of hostages who are still being held, um, meeting with uh, survivors of the Nova Music Festival, and getting involved in more of the advocacy to make sure we, that we bring the hostages home as quickly as possible. And then we'll have um, a final dinner with colleagues, and that'll be Wednesday night, and we will proceed from that to, to the airport to fly back home. Um, so it's going to be a whirlwind. Um, of course, uh, I'll be in touch via social media. Uh, Rena Lee and Shira and I have been coordinating already um, for Adat Shalom social media communications. And also, I'm, I'm very honored to share that I'll be creating content for the Rabbinical Assembly social media as well. Um, the wonderful point person over there is Emily Jager. And so we will be sharing stories through those different media um, and, and making sure that all of you know what's going on as close to the moment as possible. So now it's Parshat Miketz. We're still reading the Torah even as this war is going on. And so I wanted to share a reflection from this week's Parsha that at least to me speaks to what I'm going to be doing next week. So the beginning, near the beginning of Parshat Miketz, Pharaoh has two dreams. Now these dreams are pretty crazy dreams. There's one about cows eating other cows. There's one about ears of grain eating other ears of grain. These are very strange dreams that, that many of us have strange dreams like this sometimes where these things couldn't happen in real life. So what's going on? You know, I think if I, if I had a dream about cows eating other cows, I might want someone to interpret that dream for me. And so Joseph gives Pharaoh God's interpretation of the dream. So these cows eating other cows, these ears of grain eating other ears of grain, what it means is that there's gonna be seven years of abundance and then seven years of devastating famine. And the famine is gonna be so devastating that everyone is gonna forget the abundance that happened. All the, the last of the supplies will run out before the famine is over. And since the dream happens twice, both with the cows and with the ears of grain, this is definitely going to happen and soon. This is, this is uh, Joseph's interpretation of the dream that, that God gives him to share. So immediately after, 
Joseph interprets this dream. Joseph and Pharaoh spring into action. They make a plan. Okay, first we're going to save the food. Then we're going to put the food here. Then who's going to be in charge? Oh, he's going to be in charge. Yeah, yeah. And so they spring into action after they get this terrible news that a famine is going to devastate their population. What they don't do is stop and say, wait a second, this is terrible. Why is God doing this to us? They could stop and say, why is God giving us seven years of famine? Why doesn't God just give us abundance over and over again? But it's a time of crisis. They don't have time to stop and, and complain to God, but they're working on saving themselves and they're working on saving their people. And so for us, on October 7th, we underwent a devastating tragedy. It's, of course, it's all we can think about and we've all sprung into action whether it's wearing solidarity pins or ribbons, whether it's gathering supplies, whether it's calling our Congress people, we're not really at the point where we stopped and, and said, why did this happen? Because there, I mean, we all know that there are no satisfactory answers. This is, this is happening and this is where we are. So those who can act, those who can, can fight and defend our country, those who can collect supplies, those who can call Congress people, all those people are springing into action as we all should. Now those who are, those, not everyone can act, right? Those who have been injured, those who have been displaced, those whose family members have been killed and they're in mourning, they're not in a place to act. And so I get to go sit with them and be with them in this, in this situation where they might have a little bit more bandwidth than those who are springing into action to wonder why is this happening? And I will attempt to provide some comfort mostly just by sitting and being with them. Because in this togetherness, as we're in sharing the same space with one another, we can find strength that we wouldn't otherwise find. We can find the strength to hope for a better future, and we can find the strength to prevail over our enemies in this terrible situation. So I look forward to being here next Shabbat to tell you what I have experienced, and um, for the meantime, Am Yisrael Chai, and Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>